And Jaina, welcome. Tell us about yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll start with a brief introduction. My name is Shana Dahlin, and I work for Legal Services of Central New York, which is located in downtown Utica at 120 Bleecker Street on the second floor. We share our building with Le the Legal Aid Society, which is actually our sister organization. A lot of people kind of use our names interchangeably, but we, we do different things. Um, so I've been working with legal services for the last two and a half years, uh, almost three, uh, as a community organizer focused primarily on ending the childhood lead poisoning epidemic, which I'm, I will get into more in a, a couple minutes, but, um, in more recent time, I've tried to transition to more of tenant organizing and just more general housing um, justice issues, which I will also talk about today. Um, so just a little background on legal services for those who may not know, right? We uh, provide free civil legal help. Um, we have seven offices throughout central New York covering 13 counties. Our Utica office primarily uh, handles Herkimer and Oneida counties, uh, but we're also partnered with our, our folks up in Watertown as well. Um, but our headquarters are in Syracuse. Um, so, I mean, in the Utica office, we primarily see housing, right? Eviction defense uh, cases, but we do all sorts of things like public benefits, education, healthcare, um, I mean, you name it. So I'm really looking forward to our conversation today and please feel free to ask any questions you might have. Um, so going back to the lead poisoning um, piece, uh, not that many people I've come to realize in the last few years know the ins and outs of the cause of lead poisoning, right? Really how devastating it is to our community. Um, the last numbers that I had, um, Utica or Oneida County more broadly has about three times the amount of lead poisoned children than Flint, Michigan, and about seven times the national average. And that's mostly because we have such old housing stock, right? Um, Anything that's built before 1978 is presumed to have lead in it. Um, whether it's under layers of paint and is lead safe um, versus, you know, apartments or homes that have, you know, not been kept up um, and that just tiny amount of chipping and peeling paint or that creates dust in like, especially in windowsills or door frames, right? Just the tiny, uh, tiniest amount can have devastating effects on children under six, right? Um, leading to brain damage that's irreversible and other physical effects. And then you see later on down the line, right? Children with uh, special education needs, having difficulty controlling their emotion. And I think one of the biggest things that you see today right now in the news um, is these, this thing called the lead crime correlation. So there's been lots of studies done that ties populations with high rates of lead poisoning with high rates of violent crime. And again, I don't think this is any surprise to us when we turn on the news and see what's happening right here um, and in other similar size communities like Syracuse. Um, so I guess my big thing for, for the piece on lead, right, is letting folks know the facts, right? Um, and like most situations, prevention is <laughs> the best key. Uh, saves taxpayers money, it prevents lifelong 
health implications, right? So in New York State, all one and two year olds are required to get tested, um, get their blood tested. Um, but um, children up to six are vulnerable because it isn't until they reach that age that the blood brain barrier forms, which helps filter out uh, heavy metals and other toxins like lead. Um, additionally, again, if you know or think that your home is older than 1978, right, you can get um, test swabs, right, like at Home Depot and Lowe's, or you can have the health department come in and uh, screen. They use an x-ray gun to measure the amounts of lead in various things from paint to toys, uh, makeup, pottery, you name it. Um, so um, in terms of how can we solve the problem after it's happened, right? Um, the work that I've been focusing on is following the lead of places like Rochester and actually Syracuse was able to pass a uh, local ordinance last year, early last year, which is essentially a pre-rental inspection. Um, so the idea is that before an apartment can be rented out, right, the, the building would need to be screened for lead and then therefore remediated or fixed to some extent before a family with children can move in. Um, and Rochester was able to pass theirs a few years ago and has seen quite a dramatic decrease in the amount of lead poisoned children. Um, so uh, just to shift gears a little bit, right? Although, Lead is just one piece, right? In terms of the glaring issues in housing, right? Condition issues like other environmental things, uh, mold, right? Um, bed bugs, other kind of environmental issues, right? And right now in New York State, right, we have. Uh, unfortunately, a growing number of folks that feel like there's no option, right? Uh, home ownership is difficult for many people, especially communities of color that have had a long history of uh, housing discrimination. And I mean, I don't know if we want to kind of dig in on the history of redlining and block busting in the area. Um, the University of Richmond uh, has this really great uh, resource online called Mapping Inequality. And I, after today, I can send along um, a list of you know, other resources. But they did a nationwide uh, project and actually have found maps for Utica um, going back to like the 30s and 40s um, when this practice of redlining was at its, you know, height. And, you know, you can see it blocked up into different colors, green being the most desirable, right, or best areas to buy, blue being still desirable, uh, yellow being definitely declining, and ultimately red being dubbed hazardous, um, whether, you know, from being close to manufacturing plants or um, as, you know, dangerous as being neighbors with folks of color. Um, and they write it right in the descriptions. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty awful. Um, and I just, Speaking from my experience, you know, I never learned about any of this in my history class at school. Um, and I'd be curious to know how much um, you all have kind of heard or maybe haven't about these practices and how even today, right, we still 
have the lingering effects of these practices. While the laws have changed, right, or some of them, we still see the impact of gentrification or um, you still see a lot of NIMBY or not in my backyard sentiments about people opposing like uh, housing development projects and um, et cetera. Um, so I'll pause there. I, I see a hand. Yeah, I, I, hi, I'm Lee. Um, um, well, I first want to respond to your question. I have, I have nine years of higher education um, and I don't think redlining was ever talked about. It was, only, it was only in the past couple of years that I've learned about it. When did, when did those laws change? You said we're feeling the lingering effects. So the laws have changed, but it, is the practice still occurring and yeah, I guess to, I'd like to know when, first off, when the laws changed. Um, well, various laws changed over a different timeline and I have a great graphic that I can send. Um, you know, I think really after, especially the 60s and 70s, we started to see more fair housing implemented, but uh, I, you know, that doesn't undo the decades and, or hundreds of years of yeah. uh, damage. And yeah, I mean, thankfully, I think this side of history is finally getting the light of day, but um, I mean, unless you kind of dig for it, it's not that readily accessible. And, you know, I feel like if I was to walk down the street today and ask, you know, five random strangers, hey, do you know what red lying is? Or did you know that there's a map of Utica outlining all the details? I would doubt that anyone would know that. I, I first saw Betsy and then Yeah. yeah. Um, so first off with regard to, you know, in part to your question, um, the house my parents bought in 1959 in Spurban, Washington, um, had a covenant on it. So I've known about things like that from the time I was maybe, uh, well, in elementary school, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, redlining was, uh, again, something that did come up in some of my classes just by reading and, uh, and all both in college and uh, in seminary. Um, gentrification, I went to seminary in Chicago. Gentrification was a, a big issue. I happen to live in Otsego County. So when we say central New York, I live in a rural, community. And yeah, my house was built in the 40s, um, which is actually fairly recent, um, given where I live. So how much work are you doing with rural communities? How much work is being done really for the whole area? So much of this presbytery is rural. Yeah, that's Thanks. a great question. Um... So my original funding to do the work on lead uh, has since uh, ended, um, but since the highest numbers were happening in Utica, um, in Oneida County, right? That was my, my focus. Um, obviously, yeah, it's, it's everywhere, right? And, um, you know, out of all of our offices, the Utica office is the only other office besides Syracuse to have a community organizer. Um, and so it's kind of at this point about capacity, right? Um, and, you know, just as a side note, our organization has been 
doing a lot of work around race equity um, and just trying to move to a more community lawyering model to help communities, uh, you know, empower themselves to advocate for their issues. And um, rural organizing is a huge, a huge uh, gap that a lot of organizations haven't really invested in. Um, so I guess the short answer to your question is um, we could be doing more, <laughs> um, but there's just also like, what, what do you wanna tackle? What types of issues? Is housing your number one issue in rural communities? Is it access to, uh, for example, I know um, places like Shenango County, right? They have the poorest access to broadband internet and especially during COVID, right? Um, for children and folks working remotely, um, it's been a huge issue. So um, would love to tackle all of the issues. So how would you recommend, if I may, um, that Presbytery congregations, many of these congregations, again, are in the rural areas, they're very small congregations. How do you, what steps would you recommend that uh, are taken? Actually, Shenango County is immediately to the west of Otsego County. Yeah, my, uh, my dad and stepmother live there actually. Um, so I'm familiar with their struggles with the internet and everything. Um, I mean, like any good organizer, right? It's about um, getting folks together, talking about issues. Um, you know, you don't have to start with the hardest one. You could start, um, I know it's relative, but in, you know, low risk wins, right? And, um, working to create a strategy plan, right? Figure out, kind of do the power mapping and who, who are your targets as in, who holds the power? You know, how can they help you achieve your goals? Um, I don't know if you have a specific issue that your congregation uh, has voiced concern about. Um, I doubt that they have voiced uh, concerns. Um, although poverty is a major issue. Transportation is a major issue. Mm -hmm. uh, care for the elderly. So those are again, major issues. But I would say definitely transportation and definitely poverty are major issues in the areas where I live, which also therefore includes food issues. Yeah, I mean, it's all connected. Um, I mean, I know also too, I'm not sure for each of you, right? Um, your experience with advocacy and activism, but um, you know, in the last few years that I've noticed in the area of seeing more interfaith coalitions kind of taking a step to denounce, you know, all these issues and, you know, some people, you know, like to say, oh, I'm not political or, you know, oh, you know, that's not my thing. But unfortunately, <laughs> politics is are into you, right, as they say. And um, I think the biggest thing is making sure folks know that even a small group can make change and um, making sure that you know, local electeds know who they are, right? And what their concerns are and 
Um, I think that is one of the benefits, especially in, in rural or smaller communities is it's, uh, there's usually only maybe one or two degrees of separation between, you know, the constituent and the elected official. So it shouldn't be, right? Not saying that it isn't, but it shouldn't be, right? A barrier or um, to contact, right? Legislators and folks that have the authority and power to really make things possible, like better access to public transportation or, you know, provide funding for breakfast programs at the school or you name it, right? True enough, <laughs> but there's more always. Yes. So yes. Thank, thank you. Um, I know Mark had your hand up. Uh, this may take us backward. Um, you had had wondered if we were familiar with with redlining. Uh, for some of us, this isn't part of our educational process as much as our our lived history. Uh, I grew up in the I was in high school in the early '70s in Buffalo, and uh, redlining was a very hot issue at the time. Buffalo consistently is listed as one of the most segregated major cities in. In, in the nation. Um, and I, I could tell you where the lines, the lines um, uh, were between communities. In uh, five years ago, we bought a house in South Utica on Proctor Boulevard. And in looking, you buy a house, they have to generate all the deed documents. And looking at the deeds, when this house was built in the 1930s, there was a covenant um, which um, outlined um, to whom you could and could not sell your property. Uh, and um, yeah, I think, I think these are, are ongoing lived uh, issues, um, not simply a matter of uh, what we may have been exposed to in, in, um, in school. One of the challenges for Utica that I, I think is also not discussed is like many other communities around the nation, this city has experienced white flight. And um, even in looking for a home, the realtor we worked with very much was trying to steer us away from buying a home in the city. Um, and um, so I think the legacy of those, those patterns continue to live with us. So thank you for raising the issue. Yes, no, I'm, I'm, thank you for sharing your story too, right? I mean, yeah, you know, sometimes uh, I've seen in, you know, recent years too, the headlines of these like experiment, right? Of a uh, black couple who are getting ready to sell their home. Um, but they took out all the photo family photos right before the showing and you know the offers for <laughs> depending on who, who was there and if their original things were hung or not like it's um yeah i mean it's still very much lived experience for many people and um you know in, at least in Utica, right? We are so proud of having such a diverse uh, population, right? And love to praise the, the revitalization that many immigrants, refugees have brought. Um, yet, right, when you look around at who holds power in the city, it is not representative or reflective of the population, right? And, um, I mean, and you see this very clearly too in the school district. And I mean, that's a whole <laughs> other can of worms. But um, I mean, again, this in terms of housing justice, right? Housing justice is racial justice. It is environmental justice as we talked about um, things like lead poisoning and uh, how 
the effects of zoning, right? And it's, uh, you know, access to food, right? And talking about food deserts, right? Especially in um, poorer communities and, and yeah, it's all, all connected. And I think the more, you know, we dig into it, the, the more strings we see, right? I'm just, I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm reflecting as I, as I usually do on when, when I have these conversations or learn about these things, uh, I reflect on um, the privilege of not having to know about it because it's not your lived experience and to know about it, the deeper I follow you toward with, you know, we have a lead poisoning problem and then it's affecting the economically underprivileged and now race, and then it's leading to, to, to crime and the redlining and the, the deeper I go, the more I start to see how I've been put over here and given so much and, and so I'm a part of it, right? And I guess the question, I'm not necessarily posing directly to you, but I'd love to hear what you have to say. If I'm a part of a small, white, re well-resourced community that doesn't feel the impact of, of this, how, how, do we, how, do, how does that community mobilize? How do they come out of their, of their privilege, which I think is an ongoing conversation. But I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, so, you know, I've, I've had a lot of these conversations, especially in the last couple of years, even with my family. So I am adopted, um, my family is white. And, you know, I think acknowledging um, my own identity has been uh, interesting and, you know, for, I mean, so long, the idea of colorblindness has been like the, you know, the model to follow, right? Oh, I'm not racist. I don't see color, right? But in fact, that's doing more harm. Um, so I think going back to your question or your, you know, the sentiment you're capturing is, I think it's the difference of being non-racist versus anti-racist, right? And using those resources and knowledge to A, unlearn all the things that uh, we were taught that actually was not necessarily true. Um, learning about implicit bias, right? And that no one can be not biased, right? But just recognizing um, why we have certain emotions and reactions to different groups of people, um, et cetera. And, you know, I, I grew up in this area, but I was overseas for many years and moved back in 2016. And I'm really grateful for the people that I've met in the last six years um, who are very active and would like to see um, progress happen in the area and, you know, whether it's accountability for elected officials, whether it's building more uh, after school programs for uh, the schools, whether it's um, making sure that safe and affordable housing is prioritized, right? Um, I think, you know, just having these conversations with folks is the most important, especially as an organizer, right? Every person has, 
has their own experiences, has their own um, stories and, you know, finding finding your community of folks, whether, you know, it's, you know, a hobby, whether it's spirituality, whether it's going on a bus together to Albany to lobby. <laughs> Um, I think, uh, just, you know, finding resources, thankfully, I think more and more have started to come out in the last few years, whether, uh, it's, you know, civic education, right? Political education. Um, there's lots of great videos, books, podcasts. I mean, I, I don't know what everyone's preferred methods of media are but I'm sure there's something for everyone. Tina, you mentioned a list of resources you could provide for us. Why don't you send that to me and then I'll make sure the group gets it. And how do we engage you though? I mean if we if we we see a need we want to engage you. Do we just call you, email you and say hey let's get together? How does that happen? Yeah, so I mean, I can also send it along later, but I'll put it in the chat now. So I can put my email as Stalin at lscny.org. Um, you can also reach me at my office. or actually I'll put, so. And again, our office is in downtown Utica. It's right next to the bus hub um, at 120 Bleecker. And although we aren't necessarily open to the public yet, um, we, Hopefully we'll be doing a lot of outreach this summer, um, whether it's at you know festivals, I've done tabling at the Oneida County uh, Farmer's Market or Public Market, which is Saturdays down at the train station. Um, you know, I'm always, always looking to essentially have these conversations um, with any size groups. So whether it's your own congregations or other community groups or, you know, any other organization that you belong to, I'm happy to meet and speak um, with folks and, you know, share our resources, right? Especially, um, I have lots of resources on tenants' rights, um, information for parents with young children and about lead um, and again, kind of the other services that we provide. I have pamphlets and magnets and cards. I don't know if if anyone would prefer like, you know, hard copies, I could drop them off or mail them too. So I figured well, I'd put that out there. When we distribute to the whole group, I'll make sure your contact information is in there as well. So. Yes. Any other questions or comments for Shana? Just a, a thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for being with thank us. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank very, you for coming. Very informative, and this is this is an issue I think that touches all of us, and we're deeply concerned about it. So we're glad to make the connection with you. Yes, thank you again for giving me the time to share and. You know, I barely, I felt like I barely scratched the surface on <laughs> lots of different topics, but um, I'm happy to, again, always meet in the future and discuss other things in depth. It's where we start, scratching the surface. <laughs> yes. As we ring off today, friends, um, Tamara Rosano is having intracranial neurosurgery in Albany this afternoon. Please keep her in your prayers. Uh, Jason Cashing emailed me to tell me that he and his wife both have contracted COVID. 
So, and Shana just told me that she tested positive but was not symptomatic. So, so keep everyone, keep them in your prayers. And we'll close with a, uh, a blessing from St. Augustine. All shall be amen and alleluia. We shall rest and we shall see. We shall see and we shall know. We shall know and we shall love. We shall love and we shall praise beyond our end, which is no end. Friends, the Lord be with you. Also with you. Also with you. Bye now.